I spent a lot of time in Warrington back in 2018, mostly high, sometimes drunk, moving from squat to squat, from back room to couch, I'm somehow always able to find a place to sleep, despite not having a lease to my name for a duration of a year. The town treated me well. It's always a house party going on, a pub to drink at, a floor to pass out on. I took full advantage of the kindness of strangers and the goodwill of friends. It was in Warrington, though, that I began to hear talk of the Yellow Room. It was something like a kid's dare, but it's for grown-ups. Can you, can you spend the night in the Yellow Room? Let's see how long you last. I had no idea what the Yellow Room was, but I never met a dare that a couple of lines couldn't get me to try. I was at the horse and jockey with a friend, Baze, one night. Baze is a weird aging metalhead with a taste for quaaludes, but he's always a good laugh. We were downing a pint of something rancid when he mentioned that he might have some work for me. Before my switch to full-time fuck-up, I would trained as an electrician. Baze did some contractor work and floated me little gigs every now and again. Nothing huge, but enough to keep me in booze and pills. He started laying out the deal when I overheard the words yellow and room mumbled behind me. Immediately, I turned. A girl with a shaved head and what was either tattooed eyeballs or... Halloween contact lenses I sat three bar stools away from us, chatting away with another lass with some kind of geometric design face tattoo. I turned back to Baze, who was clearly unimpressed that he lost my attention. You want this gig or not, mate? Yeah, I replied. I, I thought I heard one of the girls say something about the yellow room. He interrupted, eyes rolling. I, I keep hearing about it. What the fuck is it? He smirked a little and explained it to me. On the outskirts of Warrington, there's a big house development. Uh, rather, there should be a big housing development. Right? A company that was putting it together went bust in 2008, financial crisis, leaving a big empty lot there, save for one house. It was supposed to be the model home. The one that estate agents would show potential buyers in order to get them to sign on the dotted line. It stood empty ever since the owners filed for bankruptcy. Ignored, forgotten its future probably a footnote at the bottom of some 20,000-page legal document that no one's ever going to read. Well, this house has gotten a bit of reputation. Well, it was initially a bit of a destination for tramps, junkies, other ne'er-do-wells. They apparently stay the hell away from the place nowadays. One of the big reasons seems to be the Yellow Room. So the paint in the place is, at least it was, white. That's Everything from skirting boards, walls, just pristine white. The one room, however, had inexplicably been given a yellow door. This is one of the bedrooms toward the back of the house on the first floor, overlooking the giant patch of grass where 20 other houses were supposed to have stood. Something about this room scares the fuck out of people. So, of course, there's a dare. Can you spend the night in the yellow room? Let's see how long you last. It took me an hour and a half to convince Baze to drive me out to the house. It took me another 20 to get him to promise to come back and pick me up in the morning. The front door of the house was closed but unlocked, so I made my way inside, keeping an eye out for any security cameras or anything else that might cause any kind of trouble. Walking inside, I saw some graffiti taggers had gotten to the walls already. I saw names, I saw swear words, accusations of, of promiscuity, and crude depictions thereof tattooed on the walls of the model home. Slowly, I walked through the house, finding the staircase, carefully ascending. The stairs creaked and buckled under my weight, but I made it up without a problem. Upstairs was more of the same. Spray paint tags all over the walls in the upstairs corridor, leading all the way down the hall stopping about six feet for the last door. The yellow painted door on the far right-hand side. I twisted the handle, I opened the door to the yellow room. And I stepped inside. The following is my attempt to explain what happened to me inside the room. I had the voice notes app on my phone all the time when I was in there. So I recorded myself talking. Some of the things I said in the voice recording conflict completely with what I remember happening. When there's a conflict, I 
I printed whatever account seemed most plausible. 10.45 p.m., entered the yellow room, found myself standing inside a uh, bedroom. A student's bedroom has a desk. There's a bookcase bed. There's no graffiti on the walls here, which I noted as odd. Also, almost every wall in the rest of the house, except for this one, so. I had the bed, feeling like I could get sleepy in the next couple of hours. Wondered if it was comfy. I hope no one fucked on it. 11.05 p.m. Realized I had spent the last 20 minutes staring out the bedroom window, watching two rats fight violently over what looked like a, like a chocolate digestive biscuit in the field outside the house. 11.06 p.m. I screamed as I turned around, and the, the haggard face behind me was staring into my eyes. I, I felt, a, I felt a, a right ass, and I realized the haggard face was, in fact, mine. <laughs> I had noticed that there was a mirror on the wall of the room when I came in. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, then I heard the creak turning around again I realized that I had left the door to the room slightly ajar something in me decided that it'd be against the spirit of the yellow room there to keep the door open so I decided to close it as soon as I did it, it creaked open again so it's, it's so much for that right sat on the bed I felt cold I reached down to feel the blanket I felt damp, so I stood up again. My jeans were wet. I felt sick. 12 a.m., midnight chimed. My ass was slowly drying off. I looked out the window again and saw that there was a dog sitting in the field, looking back at me. I turned around, expecting to see my face in the mirror again, but the mirror was so filthy that I couldn't see anything in it. I mean, I, I swear that just an hour previously, I could see my own features, plain as day. 12.10 a.m., I looked through the crack in the door at the corridor outside. I wondered about the graffiti in the corridor, and I wondered why it seemed to stop some some six feet before this room. And I just started kicking in again. My stomach was churning. Something felt tight in my throat. I hear a dripping noise. I scan the room, looking for the source. I don't find anything. 12.45 a.m., the dog's gone. Outside the window, all I can see is the empty field. The grass was swaying in the breeze, lit only by the moon. Dripping noise had only gotten louder. I looked around the yellow room, trying to find the source. My eyes glanced back at the bed, and I saw the water dripping off the blanket draped on top of it. I patted my jeans, noticing that they'd managed to dry off. I looked out the crack in the doorway, the wall... The far wall, the corridor, seemed further away than before. <sighs> my stomach was nuts. I dropped to my knees and began to dry heave. Nothing came up. 1 a.m. There was a man in the field. I could see him clearly through the window. He was dressed in a, a large brown overcoat, pair of blue jeans. His face was angular and stern. He made no movement, so he was staring up at me from the field outside. 1.15 a.m. I considered smoking the emergency joint I brought with me in my pocket to try to take the edge off my nausea. Decided against it when I looked out the window again and saw nothing outside. Not the wall. Not, not a corridor, not even darkness. There was, there, was, there was nothing outside the room. 1.20 a.m. The window's gone. The window's been taken away. 1.30 a.m., the power came on in the house. The overhead light in the yellow room, it, it switched on immediately. <laughs> I don't think the model house has ever been connected to the power grid, and if it had, it would have been disconnected years ago. Now the light was on. I could see details in the room I'd never noticed before. The walls each had small holes drilled into them, some at eye level, some much lower. I tried to peer through one, but I, I couldn't see anything. I also noticed the far wall facing the bed was actually not there. It had never been there. Why did I think there was a wall there to begin with? Clearly the bedroom was much, much larger than I thought. I, I stepped around the bed to investigate the rest of the room. I found it to be completely empty. My nausea was joined by a distant feeling of sorrow. I, I felt sad. There was nothing in this part of the room. It was empty. 
and ignored. 1.45 a.m. There was a man watching me through a crack of the door. I, I couldn't see much aside from his, his withered, deep-set eyes. I stared back at him until he went away. It's 2 a.m. I wish that the window was still there. I, mean, I, I knew I could climb out and probably survive the drop to the ground outside. I thought I could take my chances with the man or the dog or the biscuit rats if I needed to, but I couldn't stay in this room much longer. The steady drip drip of the water from the bed had become a trickle. I walked to the bed and I felt the blanket. My hand... My hand passed through it like water. The blanket was dripping dry. The bed was dripping away. Everything was dripping away. There was nothing left of the room. I reached for the joint in my pocket. I had no clue what, what to do otherwise. Instead, I pulled out a child's severed finger. I did not smoke it. 2.10 a.m. The nausea in my stomach became a shooting pain. I dropped to all fours again and threw up everything in my stomach. When I glanced down, I saw nothing but red. I looked up at the walls of the yellow room. They pursed like lips. Then they folded up and grinned, and my iPhone went dead somewhere around this time. All I remember past this was a bright glowing light and my friend Baz standing over me. I was in the yard outside the model house. I'm told I'm the person who has lasted the longest in that room, or at least the person who has lasted the longest without dying. I was in the hospital about a week. Couldn't stop throwing up. Couldn't keep anything down at all. Three days of IVs pumping fluids into my body and I was able to eat solid foods. A few days later, I was fine to leave, crashing in Baz's back room until I was able to find myself a room to rent on my own. You know, every now and again, I wake up, I come to, and I know that I'm in the... I'm in the wrong place. I look up at the ceiling above me, I notice that the ceiling is a few inches higher than it should be. There's one of the pictures on the walls missing, the couch that I'm sleeping on is... It's pulsing. It takes me a few minutes, but I always come back to what I understand as reality. I spent the night in the yellow room. And now... I'm carrying a tiny sliver of it... with me. Hey there once again, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or, you know, listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Before we say goodnight, I'd like to let you guys know about a couple of books that are available right now if you guys check out Amazon uh, before it becomes too late to get them and they're completely sold out. The Neverglade Mysteries Volume 3 should be available on Amazon very, very soon. If you guys have been keeping up with the Neverglade Mysteries, then you definitely don't want to miss out on this one. This is going to be the brand newest book and the adventures of the inspector cannot be missed. The complete version of My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown is available right now on Amazon as well. Big, thick, hardcover book, and you guys can get all the adventures as well as some insight into the next volume that should be available in that series. And of course, there's two new audiobooks from me. Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 is available on Audible, and you can check out the newest Audible book from Vince Vanacava, Pastel Colored Dreams and Human Flavored Nightmares. Both of those, very fun to work on, and I hope all of you guys enjoy them. And as always, I want to give a very huge thank you to all of my supporters out there on Patreon. I say this every time, but I truly mean it. You guys are the real MVPs, and without you, I don't think I would be able to continue doing this at the capacity that I do. Especially not as many brand new custom stories as we've been getting just for the channel. So a very special thank you to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Ken Lando Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Kraus, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764, The Banana Mafia 1, Hollow Hero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faya Lockett, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, 
Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys once again so, so much. And if you would like to join this list of people's names that I mispronounce, or the list of people's names that are down there in the description, check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta. And as always, a very sweet dreams to all of you. Good night, folks.